want to give uh, the American people an update on you know, what's happened today. Obviously, everybody remains deeply concerned about the Ebola situation. I've been working with my team uh, to address a number of issues uh, that have been raised both publicly as well as at the state and local level. So, number one, uh, obviously, uh, our heartfelt concern uh, goes out to the two nurses who've been affected. They courageously uh, treated uh, Mr. Duncan when he was in Dallas. Uh, it is typical of what nurses do uh, each and every day, uh, caring for us. And one has now been transferred to NIH, uh, National Institute of Health Facilities. The other has now been transferred to Emory University. They are getting the best possible care. Our thoughts and prayers are with them uh, and their families and uh, will continue to monitor their condition. Number two, uh, the second nurse to be diagnosed, as all of you are aware, traveled from Dallas to Cleveland and back. As a consequence, it's very important for us to make sure that we are monitoring and tracking anyone who was in close proximity to this second nurse uh, to make sure that uh, their temperatures are being taken and we know uh, that uh, they are receiving the kind of attention that they need to ensure that there's not additional spread of the disease. I spoke to uh, Governor Kasich in Ohio today, uh, who is on top of it. We have deployed CDC personnel there uh, to make sure that they are getting all the support that they need. And uh, we will continue to work both with them, uh, as well as the airlines, getting the manifests, and assuring that we are keeping track of uh, anybody who is in close proximity uh, to the second nurse. Number three, we remain focused on the situation at Texas Presbyterian in Dallas. As I've said before, when we have tight protocols with respect to the treatment of patients, then our healthcare workers are safe. But because of these two incidents, we know now that there may have been problems in terms of how protective gear is worn or removed or some of the additional uh, treatment procedures uh, uh, may have impacted potential exposure, we don't know yet exactly what happened. But in the meantime, uh, we have a number of uh, healthcare workers at Texas Presbyterian uh, who did provide care to Mr. Duncan. And we are instituting a constant monitoring process with them, giving them the information that they need uh, in order to keep themselves and their families as safe as possible uh, as the period in which they potentially could get the disease uh, you know, uh, remains uh, in place. And I also spoke to Governor Perry today about making sure that Dallas and the state of Texas had the resources that it needed in order to respond effectively if uh, additional workers at the Presbyterian uh, are determined, in fact, to have been exposed uh, and have contracted Ebola. Uh, and Governor Perry as well as Mayor Rawlings uh, in Dallas, obviously been extraordinarily cooperative, working with the CDC, working with Health and Human Services. Uh, they have legitimate concerns in terms of making sure that uh, the federal government is serving the kinds of resources that it, uh, they need in order to handle any eventuality there, uh, to make sure that there are folks, not just at Texas Presbyterian, but potentially at other healthcare facilities have the training and the equipment that they need uh, and so we're going to be working very closely with them uh, over the course of the next several days and weeks in order to assure that they have uh, exactly what they need uh, to get the job done. Uh, throughout this process, I've been focused on making sure that we are dealing with this problem at the source. Uh, the most important thing, in addition to treating and uh, monitoring anybody who even has a hint of potential exposure here in this country, the most important thing that I can do for uh, keeping the American people safe is for us to be able to deal with the goal at the source, uh, where you've got a huge outbreak in West Africa. Uh, and the United States uh, is 
obviously leading the way in terms of providing resources, equipment, and mobilizing the world community. So over the last several days, I continue to call other world leaders to get them to up their pledges of equipment, of personnel, uh, logistics, uh, logistical uh, uh, you know, capabilities to make sure that we're getting our workers on the ground there. We've seen some progress in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, but we haven't seen enough. We've got more work to do. Uh, and the good news is, is that uh, increasingly, when I talk to these world leaders, what you're seeing is a recognition that the sooner we control this outbreak at the source in North Africa, the less uh, our, first, uh, our people uh, are going to be at risk. And I think more and more of them are stepping up, although uh, it's, I think, taking a little longer than it should. Uh, and that's something that uh, all of us should recognize. Uh, one issue that I want to address, because I know this has been a topic uh, consistently in the news, is the issue of a travel ban. Uh, and I know that you've heard from some public health experts about this, but I want to make sure that uh, everybody's clear about uh, the issue. I don't have a philosophical objection necessarily to a travel ban if that is the thing that is going to keep the American people safe. The problem is, is that in all the discussions I've had thus far with experts in the field, experts in infectious disease, is that a travel ban is less effective than the measures that we are currently instituting that involve screening passengers who are coming from West Africa. First of all, screening them before they get on the plane there to see whether they're showing signs of the disease. Then screening them again when they get here, taking their temperature. And now what the CDC is doing is gathering all their information, assuming that they're not showing any signs of illness. Because if they are showing signs of illness, obviously, we want to make sure that they are uh, directed to a well-equipped and well-prepared facility. But if they're not showing any signs, we still want to have their information, where they live, where they're staying, multiple contact information that not only the federal government keeps, but that will also be forwarded to the state where they reside. If we institute a travel ban instead of the protocols that we put in place now, uh, history shows that there is a likelihood of increased uh, avoidance. People do not readily disclose their information. They may engage in something called broken travel, essentially breaking up their trip so that they can hide the fact that they have been to one of these countries where there is a disease in place. And as a result, we may end up getting less information about who uh, has the disease. They're less likely to get treated properly, screened properly, quarantined properly. And as a consequence, we could end up having more cases rather than less. Now, uh, I continue to push and ask our experts whether, in fact, we are doing what's adequate in order to protect the American people. If they come back to me and they say that there's some additional things that we need to do, I assure you we will do it. But it is important in these circumstances for us to look at the history of how these infectious diseases are best dealt with. Uh, and it is currently the judgment of all those who have been involved that uh, a flat out travel ban is not the best way, way to go. Uh, but we will continue to monitor this. I'm asking these questions. And uh, if, in fact, it turns out that I'm getting different answers, then I will share that with the American people. And we will not hesitate to do what's necessary in order to maximize the chances uh, that uh, we avoid an outbreak here in the United States. Uh, which brings me to my last point. Uh, I understand that people are worried. This is a disease that is new to uh, our shores, although it is something that has cropped up periodically uh, in other countries. Uh, because of the virulence of the disease uh, and uh, the way it's transmitted and the symptoms uh, that uh, occur, uh, I understand that people are scared. But what I want to emphasize once again is that right now we've got one individual who came in with the disease. We have two nurses who uh, have been diagnosed with the disease as a consequence of, in some fashion, being exposed to drug treatment. And what remains true is that this is not an airborne disease. It is not easy to catch. You can only catch it 
through being in contact with the bodily fluids of an individual who not only has the disease, but also is showing symptoms of the disease. Uh, and so it's important, I think, for all of us to keep perspective in terms of how we handle this. We are taking this uh, very seriously at the highest levels, starting with me. And my entire team uh, is been essentially uh, deputized to work with uh, Health and Human Services and CDC. And that includes, by the way, the Department of Defense uh, and our national security team. We understand why it's important for us to provide assurances to the public that folks are taking this very seriously, and they are. And obviously, because of the two nurses getting sick, that has made people that much more concerned. So all that's understood. But I do want everybody to understand that it remains a very difficult disease to catch. And if we continue to take the steps that we need to, uh, then this will be contained. Uh, and uh, the, the main thing that uh, everybody needs to focus on is that uh, the, the, the risks involved remain relatively low, extremely low, for ordinary folks. The biggest thing we have to do is make sure that health workers have more confidence because they are on the front lines and we're entering into flu season, which means that there are a lot of people who may be coming in with symptoms and there may be false alarms and concerns. And so we're gonna spend a lot of time working with our public health workers uh, to make sure that they feel safe and adequately protected. Uh, but I wanna assure the American people, we're taking this seriously, but this is something that's really hard to catch. And if we do what we need to do, uh, and you stay focused, um, then uh, this is going to be something that is contained here. The work that we have to do overseas is going to be a lot tougher because, frankly, they don't have a public health infrastructure. They're not well organized. They're poor countries, uh, and uh, the epidemic uh, is already raging there. So that's going to take several months uh, for us to be able to start seeing the kinds of progress that we need to see. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, uh, I want uh, everybody to know that uh, everybody here is on the case. All right? Thanks very much. Mr. Thank President, you. Thank 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 you. Uh, and doing an outstanding job in dealing with a, what is a very complicated uh, and fluid situation. Uh, those of you who don't know, Lisa Monaco, who does a lot of my counterterrorism work, as well as national security work, uh, has been working with our Secretary of Health and Human Services and Tom Frieden uh, at the CDC. Uh, uh, it may be appropriate for me to appoint an additional person, not because the three of these folks have not been doing an outstanding job, I should mention, and Susan Wright, my national security advisor. It's not that they haven't been doing uh, an outstanding job uh, really working hard on this issue, uh, but they also are responsible for a whole bunch of other stuff. So Lisa is also dealing, as Susan is, with ice, and you know, we're going into flu season, which means, by the way, people should be looking to get their flu shots. Uh, we know that every year tens of thousands of people potentially uh, die of the flu, uh, and hundred thousand or more may be actually going to the emergency room and hospitalized because of the flu. So that's something that Tom also is responsible for. So I, I, it may make sense for us to uh, have one person in part of this so that uh, after this initial surge of activity, uh, we can have a more regular process uh, just to make sure that we're crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's uh, going forward. Do you know okay. who that so would be? Would that be soon? Uh, if I appoint somebody, I'll let you know. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.